Some of the governors have done a fantastic job working with us. I told the governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, that I disagree strongly with his decision to open certain facilities which are in violation of the Phase 1 guidelines for the incredible people of Georgia. They're incredible people. I love those people. They are — they're great. They've been strong, resolute. But at the same time, he must do what he thinks is right. I want him to do what he thinks is right. Uh, but I disagree with him on what he's doing. But I want to let the governors do. Now, if I see something totally egregious, totally out of line, I'll do. But I think spas and beauty salons and tattoo parlors and barber shops in uh, phase one — we're going to have phase two very soon. It's just too soon. I think it's too soon. President Trump, who has been trying to move the country toward a more open status for the economy, saying here that he thinks Georgia is moving too fast. Now, I, I've, I've seen a lot of back and forth on this one, from, from even from some conservatives who were saying, well, hold on a second. Now, now the president is telling a, a Republican governor who wants to open up his, open up his state uh, that he's moving too fast. Well, they put out the guidance, and, and I understand, too, it seems like there's, there's mixed messages here. In fact, there's some very, very clever social media uh, videos going around. One in particular, I think, was uh, making the rounds on Twitter where people are saying, why is anyone confused? And then they go through all the different conflicting guidance about how to handle this, because we have gotten a lot of conflicting guidance. But in this particular case, the president is saying, that there's a violation of, I shouldn't say violation might be too strong, but they're not in keeping with the phase one guidelines yet in Georgia, so they may be moving too fast. You know, my friends, we will see. We will see what ends up being true here because the economic devastation, you know, we're, we're going through a period where unless you don't have a job and don't have savings, you cannot really understand what that's like. What what's what's going on for people that have those circumstances that are supposed to push through that right now? I mean, I, I'm it's it's just I can't imagine, honestly, it's because we don't know when the economy is really going to come back on and what's going to happen even when even when it does. There could be further layoffs. There's a lot of, of debt and a lot of financial stuff that's going to need to be cleared up and cleared out. And industries may never be the same. I mean, I got to tell you this. I wouldn't want to be the owner of a commercial real estate building in New York City right now. I think there's going to be a lot of big, expensive leases for office space getting signed, right? I mean, maybe. Maybe some people are figuring it's all going to go back to normal sooner than later. But I just feel like the the change in, in, in anyone who is getting really used to working from home and see, sees what their productivity is really like, I, I don't know how fast they're going to want to move back, even if they could safely, entirely safely. I'm not sure how quickly they'd want to move back to an office environment. I mean, I'll be honest, I hate office environments. So it's one of the reasons why I work in media, because I show up and do a show and then I go home. I don't sit at a desk. I'm not. It's one of the things I like most about this job. Now, that was involving studios and travel and it wasn't staying home all day. But I'm not somebody who likes to spend and I've done it before nine, 10, 11, sometimes 12 hours a day in an office environment. It's not my thing. Um, but the, the situation of Georgia is going to be instructive for all of us because he, here's what does not get talked about very much these days. The Swedish model is working. Sweden is OK. I saw two weeks ago uh, I was seeing all these pieces. Sweden is heading for disaster. Sweden is going to be falling apart. You know, and I said, look, they're either going to learn a very painful lesson, I suppose, or they're going to show that the total panic response of shut down, shut everything down, stay home, don't go outside unless you absolutely have to, that that wasn't really necessary. Well, Sweden is, in fact, and I also keep hearing people say, oh, the other, I looked at the numbers on this one. The, 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 uh, the story that you'll hear is that the other, um, the other people, I mean, the other states, rather, in, in the neighborhood, the other countries, Denmark, Finland are doing so much better than they are. And it turns out that that's not when you look at it on a per capita basis. That's not really true. That's not the case. 
that it's pretty close. And Sweden has allowed people to continue. Think about what America would be like right now if stores were still open, bars were still open, restaurants were still open, and you're allowed to go to your place of work. And you're allowed to go outside. Unrestricted outside travel. Seniors are under much more strict quarantine controls because we know this disease is particularly bad for seniors. It's particularly dangerous for our seniors. But uh, the, the rest of the society is able to keep things going, which means a more robust economy, doctors and nurses getting paid, materiel and, and research continuing to get funded for all of this, people not worried about paying their bills quite the same way, and, and having a healthy society economically is very important for having a healthy society um, in general, right? For having people who are healthy with, within your, uh, in, in your country. And, you know, you look at the, the numbers. For, I'm trying to find this. There's a, oh, here we go. This is from CNBC. Sweden resisted a lockdown and its capital, Stockholm, is expected to reach herd immunity in weeks. CNBC piece, just, just this morning. Unlike its neighbors, Sweden did not impose a lockdown. The strategy aimed at building a broad base of immunity while protecting at-risk groups like the elderly that was considered controversial. Sweden's chief epidemiologist, Sweden's Dr. Fauci, has said herd immunity could be reached in Stockholm within weeks. Now, you're going to see a lot of people say, oh, but, you know, herd immunity, you need 90 percent. No, herd immunity at 90 percent means the disease is completely eradicated. Herd immunity at 60 percent means that transmissibility has slowed considerably and a lot of people are able to just go around not worrying about it. It means your likelihood of a major outbreak, you know, a pandemic outbreak, I should say, is much, much smaller. You know, so, yes, you, you herd immunity from uh, from measles, which we don't want any, you know, in the United States, we can get to a place where you have basically zero cases of that. Right. Well, that that requires about a 90, 95 percent inoculation rate. And then if you have a few people here and there who don't get it, but then, as, as we know, people that don't like vaccines and I'm not I'm not trying to have that discussion now. I'm just telling you what the epidemiological research says. Good heavens. You talk about vaccines and all of a sudden your inbox is nothing but vaccine stuff. Um, but here, herd immunity just means that they're getting to a place where they're not worried about pandemic outbreak uh, or an epidemic in the case of within the borders of Sweden. Right. Epidemic is considered a slightly less. Uh, slightly less extreme outbreak of the disease than a pandemic. But they're even able to withhold that from happening just by having about 60 percent of the population that does not ha- that has had it and doesn't have to worry about getting it again. So, you know, wh- what happens with this now? I saw all these people that were very sure about this. Oh, Sweden is heading for disaster. Sweden is heading for disaster. no. It's not true. That's not what ended up being the case. So we should ask, why is that true? Here you go. The number of cases in Sweden is almost double that in neighboring Denmark. It has 8,108 cases, as reported, and 370 deaths. And Finland, with just over 4,000 cases and 141 deaths, that impose strict lockdown measures. But since their populations are each about 5 million, half of Sweden's, the rates are about the same. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a little, I'm a little, I was a little annoyed with myself on this because I kept having, you know, the Twitter, the Twitter ankle biters coming after me. Not as good as Finland. Not as good as Denmark. I'm just trying to say, look, and again, why are people rooting against there being a better way? This would be better for, if Sweden works, that's good for humanity. That's good for everybody. So can't we look at this without it being a, it's not a, you know, Trump, anti-Trump thing. It's a can we have our lives back thing a little bit more, a little bit more, not entirely. Sweden has, you know, Sweden has restrictions on the number of you know, they shut down. Uh, they've shut down. I Wait, have they shut down schools? Hold on to that. I got to figure that one out. But they have restrictions on the size of gatherings. They have uh, seniors, um, you know, under lockdown. I mean, there are things that they're doing. They you know less people in restaurants, less people in bars. They're not, you know, people are covering their, their mouths with masks and stuff. They're not saying, yeah, it's a free for all. They're just not saying we're going to we're going to stop society for a couple of months. Just stop it. Everyone stay home. That's the lockdown that we're doing here. What? But people are coming after me saying, oh, no, but look at Finland and look at Denmark. And I thought that they must have meant per capita because that's the only comparison that matters. No, it turns out on a per capita basis, Sweden and Finland's about the same. 
So, so what are we to take from this? On a per capita analysis of two societies that are very, very similar, that are operating on the same timeline of virus exposure, let's say Sweden and Denmark, just to make this a little bit you know, geographically even closer. Sweden and Denmark, and when you look at it per capita, there was, oh, Sweden schools are open. Thank you, Producer Mark. That was what I thought. They didn't shut the schools, folks. It's a huge thing. Here in New York, there's hundreds of thousands of kids in the public school system. They're locked in at home. They don't, and especially if they're younger, like, what the heck is going on here? The, the risk to people under 20, statistically, is, I mean, it's not zero from this disease, but it's close, man. It is very small. So we shut down all the schools? You know, we couldn't find enough teachers under the age of 40 who wanted to, you know, keep, uh, and look, I know it would have been hard and everything else, but so schools are open in Sweden. They didn't shut down the schools. And they're reopening schools in other European countries that have been hit really hard. But we do have a control group now. We have Sweden and we have Denmark. Denmark went with the full-on lockdown. Sweden did not. They're in the same position. So now that we know this, why am I always being told that the lockdown was entirely necessary and we couldn't have taken the approach of Sweden? Okay, Sweden has less comorbidities than we do. I mean, we, we can have conversations about this, but hold on a second. Sweden and Den- Denmark doesn't have a lot of comorbidities that Sweden doesn't have. These are very similar societies, demographically, health-wise, age-wise, culturally. So, you know, this would be like saying you have, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont and new and I'm, this is, I'm just giving a hypothetical, of course. But if you had, you know, New Hampshire had a total shutdown and Vermont had like the less extreme, you know, still maintaining you know, businesses open, and everything else. And they ended up in the exact same place case wise per capita when you when you average it up per capita. Well, then isn't the less extreme lockdown model better? Someone needs to explain to me why that's not the case and also why everyone was pl- why everyone was proclaiming before they knew that Sweden was a disaster. I mean, I just it's from this morning. It's CNBC saying, yeah, the Swedish the Swedish government's like, we're doing well, actually, with this thing. It's tough, but we're getting through it. And they didn't spend four trillion dollars and shut down their whole economy for a couple of months. My friends, what the heck are we doing here? You're, you're, I mean, you're talking about encouraging hundreds of thousands of people to come to Las Vegas. Back. I get the, the financial yeah. losses people are suffering, which is awful. But you're encouraging, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people coming there in casinos, smoking, drinking, touching slot machines, breathing circulated air, and then returning home to states around America and countries around the world. Doesn't that sound like a virus Petri dish? I mean, how is that? You know what it sounds like? You're being an alarmist. I'm not. I've lived a long life. I grew up in the heart of Manhattan. I know what it's like to be with subways and on buses and crammed into elevators. I think you are by saying what you have just said. So you don't believe there should be any social distancing? You don't believe that this is. Of course, I believe there should be. Of course. I'm a How do you do that in a casino? That's up to them to figure out. I don't own a casino. But no, notice how this is what you get. And, of course, there's CNN again. Notice how this is what you get. The moment that you say, well, we don't want to do the extreme lockdown, they say, so you don't want to do anything? No. And even this mayor in Las Vegas is saying, that's not what I'm saying. Right? The, the Sweden model is not everybody run around and hug and kiss and dance in big circles and go to huge events and, you know, all drink out of the same cup. And, of course not. Right? We're not morons. But it's all about gauging the response. You know, there's a more extreme response uh, response than even we've done here. I mean, you look, there's videos in China where they've just had another outbreak in a northern city, I would note. But we we could have the government come and and, uh, you know, put people not just in their homes, but lock them in their homes. Right. We could have uh, people soldering the door shut so that you can't leave. You're stuck inside and they'll come out and get you in a few weeks when they feel like it. Right. That's a more. That's what China did. That's even more extreme than what we did. So there's clearly levels here. And we should have a a fair discussion about those levels. Now, look, I know we're moving state by state and we're going to start to see this. But aren't we all rooting for every state that opens early to do great? 
Do you really feel like everyone out there is rooting for every state that opens early, particularly if it's a red state? Do you think that all, all the, the liberal commentators and the Democrats, are they rooting for all these states to do really well, or do they want them to be a warning to other states? I, I wonder. I think you do have to ask the question. By the way, CNN's uh, Cooper here continues to go after this Las Vegas mayor for wanting to take a more open approach. Here's, here's how that went. Play 13. So I just want to put up Ooh, for our viewers. <laughs> I just want to put up for our viewers. This is a, a restaurant. Anderson, you are tough. <laughs> no, I'm not talking. We're back just, to China. This isn't China. Yeah, this, this is, is Las a, Vegas, Nevada. Wow. Okay, that's really ignorant. This is a restaurant and the that's yellow circle, say that's an ignorant, that, ignorant statement. That's, that's a restaurant, <laughs> and yes, it's in China, but there are human beings too. I, I just, I don't really understand. I, I don't understand what, I, I keep asking this. What is, what is the mainstream media, what do they think they're really accomplishing with a lot of the coverage? Look, some of it is they're just providing information, but keep in mind with the internet, how much of this do we really need from them? You know, we have all these different news organizations, so many of them. What are they? Re- what value are they really adding? You have to ask, I mean, what, what does CNN bring you that MSNBC or ABC or any of these other news outlets or NPR doesn't? And the answer is really nothing. So that's why it's really opinion masquerading as, an, as objective news, which is why so many of the news stories that you do see end up having such a clear political angle to them. But... I, I would note that we are going to see how it works in these different states. The, the president has laid out guidance for them. And we're all hoping, or should be hoping, I know you and I are, I wonder about some others, that the states that open up the soonest are surprisingly, uh, have surprisingly low levels of cases afterwards, and we can all start getting back. You know, don't we just all want our lives back? I, I really do wonder sometimes how many people on the left view, you, you know, if, if we did a... Um, you know, if we did a poll, how many people on the left view Trump's election and COVID-19 as things that must be dealt with simultaneously, right? To prevent Trump r- winning, that's, that's something that has to be factored into all of our COVID analysis. I wonder. You know where you get great news? And you can always go and see stories that are going to matter to you and also see our commentary and we tell you what we think. We tell you what angle we're coming from here. BuckSexton.com. It's a fantastic website, my friends, with more and more content being added every day. Go check it out. We'll have stories from today's show as well as news stories from all across the spectrum uh, online. And uh, no, no, uh, no fake news nonsense going on there. No, oh, we're also just objective. No, no, no. Uh, you, know what our, you know what our slant is at BuckSexton.com? America. We love America. That's right. Go check out the site, bookmark it today, and check in every morning. Back by popular demand, we have Clay Travis in the house. He is the host of the Outkick the Coverage podcast. He is also a writer, a speaker, all around thinker. You've probably seen the book Republicans Buy Sneakers Too. He is the man. Thank you so much, sir. Good, good to have you back on the show. Hey, appreciate you having me, man. So let's talk about uh, COVID-19 if we can for a minute first. Um, we have talked about this in the past and you were willing to ask questions that got you, I'm sure, a lot of uh, negative attention from the consensus, which is that we lock down, we do what we're told, we don't ask questions. That's what I view as, as the problem here. Uh, where do you feel like things are now versus where we were then? What, what, what has surprised you? What, what in your mind have we learned or do we still need to learn as a country about dealing with this? Yeah, I think those are big questions. And to me, what we most need uh, more so than anything else is data, right? In order to make smart public policy decisions, you need the most accurate and the best data you can find anywhere. And in particular, you need to know infection rates, How common is this? What are the antibody rates? How many people have had it? And also contagion rates. How easily does this spread? Where does it spread? How does it spread? What's the most efficient way that this virus spreads? And then do whatever we can to try to dial that back in the weeks and months ahead. And so uh, to me, 
Uh, I think the data still needs to get better because all of the forecasting and all of the models right now is predicated on input, right? I mean, you don't have to be a, a epidemiologist uh, or a genius in virology to know that the infection rate and uh, the contagion rate determine everything as it, as it pertains to where this virus is going to go. So the models are only as good as the input data, which uh, is reliable that the models rely on themselves. And I think throughout uh, most of this outbreak so far, we've been relying on models that are not very accurate because the underlying data is not very accurate either. Do you feel like the state by state reopen plan is is the way to go at this point? And how are you? Tell us. I mean, I know you're in Nashville, you're in Tennessee. Uh, how are things going in your city and in your state? Very well here in Tennessee, uh, certainly compared to many other places that are much harder hit. And yeah, I do. I think this is a triumph of federalism, Buck. Um, I mean, I think that the benefit of opening states as they see fit based on local mayor and governor and city council, even conversations that are going on, makes sense because that allows us to use the individual states as federalism laboratories to see whether or not uh, we are prepared as a nation to open back up. Now, personally, I tend to think smaller states opening first makes sense from a population perspective, simply because if they get it wrong, then the overall impact is not as draconian and severe as, say, if California gets it wrong or New York gets it wrong. Obviously, New York's in the middle of it. But a state like Tennessee with a population of around 7 million, uh, if we believe we're ready to go back uh, and and start to open up and return to normal uh, activity, I think it makes a lot of sense. The data on the ground reflects that we should. Now, Texas is a big state, but Texas has had per capita the lowest of the big states uh, in terms of deaths, right? And so I think the governor down in Texas is making a good decision as well. I think, you know, this is boots on the ground analysis. We don't necessarily need a one size fits all policy because, frankly, most places are not New York City. And on the sports side of things, I know that you know you you cover general general news, but also you're generally you're you're generally thought of sorry as a uh, as a, a sports analyst. What what happens now? What what are the leagues? You know, you're much more up to speed on this. And isn't there a draft that's happening? I mean, where are we with with the world of professional sports? Because I think that people, you know, one of the one of the components, one of the reasons why everyone's always just saying Netflix and we don't have any sports to watch right now. It does feel like there's this huge gap in American culture and. For a lot of folks, I know that's just a big, necessary and, and positive escape. You know, it's a, it's a place where they can go and have fun and think about other things. Uh, and I know that that's that's a big part of, of what your audience is getting when they're hearing about sports all the time. Where are we with the leagues? I mean, are, are, are they kind of coming back? Are they going to try to do stuff without people in the stands? What can you tell us? Well, I think they're incredibly apprehensive because, as we talked about in your first question, the data sets that we have to rely upon right now are not particularly accurate. And so as you start to make decisions on behalf of sports leagues, I think there are several things that have to be considered. First of all, the PGA, the golf, is coming back on June 11th. uh, And NASCAR seems to be uh, targeting a May 24th return. Of course, those sports are unique because they're not team-based contact sports in the same way that, say, basketball or uh, basketball or football or, uh, or hockey would be, for instance, or even soccer. Uh, So every sport is going to be a little bit different in terms of its overall impact. Uh, But I believe as the infection rates continue to climb and we see European soccer leagues, for instance, the Bundesliga in Germany, start to come back, there are policies that can be put in place to allow these leagues to return. And remember, for Major League Baseball or the NBA or hockey or soccer probably as well, these athletes are going to require three, four weeks to get back into peak physical condition before they can return to actually playing their sports. I think we'll start to see a lot of that take place in terms of training camp style, spring training uh, for the sports as we come into May. And I would suspect by late June and into July, based on the trend lines that are out there about the coronavirus right now, uh, that it makes sense that they can maybe come back. And you asked a good question, like how in the world does a guy who otherwise talks about sports end up talking about the coronavirus uh, as much as I have? This is the biggest story in the history of sports. The intersection of the coronavirus with sports is literally creating situations that have never occurred in the world of sports before. And I think the return of sports is in many ways a symbol and sign of the uh, of the resiliency of America and the world. When sports comes back for many people, it is a sign of normalcy 
they can start to recognize that they aren't going to be living sheltered in place forever in the method that they are right now. Sports is a big part of that return to normalcy. How have we uh, seen the financial impact of this play out with the various leagues? You know, Harvard, which has a $40 billion endowment, which I'm guessing is, is bigger than the, uh, the cash pile that a lot of different sports leagues would be sitting on at any given time. Uh, you know, they took the money and they, now they're saying they're giving it back after Trump called them out at the press conference. But have there been any, any particular uh, you know, league fallouts from, from just the financial freeze here? Are there, are there worries that there'll be some teams that just you know, can't pay their bills? I mean, I'm just wondering. I, I, don't, I don't know the economics of, of professional sports teams very well. Uh, Producer Mark probably knows them a lot better than I do. But is everyone pretty much planning on coming back as is as soon as there's the all clear signal? Or is it a little bit like the we're not sure how we're going to do this because we've lost so much revenue? Well, every sport's different, right? So uh, the NBA and the NHL got a substantial portion of their regular season complete. Major League Baseball has never been able to start. The NFL has been totally unimpacted so far. So every sport you have to kind of dive into the particulars. The NBA is a good example. Players recently uh, were told they're going to get a 25% pay cut uh, in the near future. But I mean, honestly, when you look at the business of sports, the most impacted people, and we don't talk about them enough, are the guy or girl who are walking around selling hot dogs and beer, you know, inside of the stadium, the people who are in charge of being ushers, uh, the people who sell parking around the stadiums, uh, all of the janitorial services that work inside of these stadiums. You know, the athletes and the owners are rich. Uh, The idea that they are going to suddenly fall off the face of the earth uh, because they miss a couple of paychecks is not true. But many of the people who work in the industry of sports overall to support this massive uh, entertainment product are living on the edge. And they are the ones who have been oftentimes the most impacted. You know, uh, the uh, the live sports, uh, whether they're going to return. Uh, Television is a huge component of overall sports revenue. So far, those payments continue. Uh, But the the gate revenue for something like baseball that has 162 games, I think 40 percent of baseball's revenue is predicated on uh, people coming to the games. And that's where the salaries come from. And I think uh, a lot of people are going to end up losing a lot of money and already are uh, associated with the sports, even if they come back uh, for television. How successful have some of the leagues been, the the more impacted leagues? You mentioned baseball um, and making sure that those hourly workers are. are, I saw, what was it, a player for the for the Pelicans, I believe, who and I know that's NBA, but, you know, he he Williamson. Yeah, he was paying everyone's, you know, everyone at his stadium salary. Have there has there been more of that? I mean, look, people think of these athletes. And as you point out, some of them aren't just a little bit rich. They're like crazy rich. Uh, are there more stories yeah. like that out there? Have they been making sure that the people that are selling the T-shirts with Zion's name in them, you know, they, they still can feed their families? Yeah, I think a lot of athletes and owners have done a great job, you know, reaching out. And certainly a story that got a lot of attention was Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots, sending a Patriots private team plane to China to try to get some of these uh, N95 masks in the midst of the uh, PPE uh, shortness. I think he brought back uh, over a million of those on a private jet. Um, But yeah, a lot of players and owners, I think, have done a good job. The question is, how long is this going to continue, right? I mean, I think that's the question that is out there in a big way. And we haven't even talked about it. But for colleges, you know, college athletic departments are predicated in many ways on having a football season. They already missed the NCAA tournament, which is a big moneymaker. But if uh, if the college football season were not going to happen, Many of these leagues, uh, you know, the uh, major leagues and also many colleges would be absolutely hammered from a uh, financial perspective. So I think in many ways, sports is a mirror for the larger society. I'm sure your radio show has been impacted like my radio show has been impacted, like so many people who are listening to us right now, regardless of what they do for a living. Their jobs have likely been impacted in a significant and, uh, and profound way by this as well. And I think this is one of the examples of, you know, sports sh- sort of holding up a mirror to society and uh, and referencing that ultimately they are a business as well. And like many businesses that rely on having paid audiences that support their product, they are suffering. And uh, tell me about the potential of the leagues isolating the entire league in one city to play the rest of the season or the whole season with baseball. You think that might happen? 
Baseball's newest plan is actually to use Texas, Florida, and Arizona as three different distinct locations with domed stadiums that they could theoretically use to avoid rainouts. Their previous plan that had leaked was to be in the Phoenix area and all be located in the same city. I actually think the NBA, if it comes back, may well end up in Las Vegas. Uh, at where they have the ample hotel rooms and access to basketball courts where they could theoretically continue their season. The NHL is talking about using four different cities as well to finish its season. So I think what you're probably looking at is a, uh, a system that has three or four different cities with the exception of the NBA, uh, where they can locate multiple franchises and be e easily able to play multiple games uh, and particularly get players back up into shape. And then I think the hope would be by July, uh, you know, as you move into the summer and hopefully there's a negative impact from warm weather on the spread of the coronavirus, that maybe you could at least return to the physical locations and start to allow these team planes to fly across the country, whether that means that you'd be able to have fans uh, present in, the, in those months, maybe July and August uh, in the hot uh, part of the summer, I think remains to be seen. And I think certainly the fall is a challenging part here as you think about cold weather in November and December, when the flu typically kicks up again, will it happen uh, with this particular coronavirus or not is a good question. Before I let you go, Clay, uh, my producer, producer Mark, has said that the new Michael Jordan doc, we're all looking for new stuff to watch. I'm yeah. excited about The Last Kingdom coming back on Netflix, for example. But he's telling me i got to watch this ESPN Michael Jordan doc. I just wanted, wanted your take on it before we let you get back to everything you got going on. Fabulous. Uh, six million, over six million people watched it. Most uh, largest audience for a sports documentary on cable of all time, nearly doubled the previous high. I think people are starved for sports content. I think they're starved for original content in general. Witness the success of the Tiger King uh, and Ozark shows like that on uh, on Netflix. Uh, but if you grew up in any way following the Michael Jordan era, it's a uh, spectacular look at the 1990s era dynasty Bulls. Uh, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, uh, names that are iconic and legendary. I've got three boys, 12, 9, and 5, and I have them watching it because obviously Jordan predated them. But, Buck, one of the crazy things about it is I don't feel like I'm that old of a guy. I just turned 41 this month. Um, but when I look around and realize that there are like 25-year-old guys now in my audience who are consuming my content every day that were too young to have ever watched a Michael Jordan Bulls game, it blows my mind because, uh, you know, he is uh, sort of the quintessence, uh, I think, of a sports figure for many people of my generation. And uh, to be able to uh, allow other people to experience that Jordan era through this documentary and for people like me to be able to go back in time and nostalgically re-remember it is a pretty fantastic way to spend your Sunday evening uh, in this uh, quarantine that we find ourselves in midst of right now. Is Jordan the greatest of all time? Oh, yeah. There's no doubt. There's right. no doubt. I like how he, does, he doesn't even hesitate, player. folks. He's not he's not pandering to the like, LeBron fans. He's going right for it. No. Well, look, Mike Trout is a better baseball player than Babe Ruth, right? I think if you put them both, if you reincarnated Babe Ruth and he was the, the, at his peak and you put him next to Mike Trout, who's probably the best player in Major League Baseball right now, Trout's a better player. But Babe Ruth is the legend. He defines baseball. Michael Jordan is the legend. I'm not sure who would win if they played a one-on-one -on -one game at their peaks. But I can tell you right now that Jordan is the Babe Ruth of basketball, much more so than LeBron is. Steph Curry's more influential uh, with kids today than, than LeBron is, frankly. All right, everybody. Clay Travis, always interesting. Thank you so much, Clay. Uh, Outkick the coverage is the podcast. And check out Republicans Buy Sneakers, too. I'm a Republican, and I buy sneakers, so it's true. Thanks, sir. It's a, it's a Jordan quote, after all. Appreciate it, Buck. message this morning making a rather big announcement for our military when it comes to Iranian Iranian aggression. Are you going to change uh, formally rules of engagement for our U.S. military so that they can we'll cover engage? It. We'll cover it 100 uh, percent. We don't want their gunboats surrounding our boats and traveling around our boats and uh, having a good time. We don't want them anywhere near our boats. And so you know the order I gave. I don't think I have to say it again, but I've given that order. Uh, under the Obama administration it was taking place all the time. Under my administration, I gave this order early on, and nothing happened. They were very nice. There was no problem. 
But then I noticed yesterday they did that in a much lighter form, but they did that again. I said, we're not going to we're not going to stand for it. So if they do that, that's putting our ships at danger and our great crews and sailors at danger in danger. I'm not going to let that happen. And we will. They'll shoot them out of the water. The U.S. military does not have to change its rules of engagement in order to follow your... Well, that's the rules directive. of engagement. That's a threat when they get that close to our boat. And they have guns. They have very substantial weapons on those boats. But we'll shoot them out of the water. This is in reference to President Trump's tweet. I've instructed the United States Navy to shoot down and destroy any and all Iranian gunboats if they harass our ships at sea. Commander-in-Chief's not playing games these days. I think the Iranians might want to take notice. We, we are not, this country is not to be trifled with these days. That's for sure.